Good evening. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. Coming up on the program, a peek inside the growing business of weed, plus how did recreational marijuana sales fare over the weekend? The latest on the Australian bushfires and a photographic look at River North in its gritty past. But first tonight, Carol Marine, Carol Marine with a look at the aftermath of the U.S. drone strike in Iraq. Carol. Paris, thank you. Hundreds of thousands of people today filled the streets of Tehran as Iran mourned the loss of its military leader, General Qasem Soleimani, who was killed in an American drone strike in Iraq on Friday. Soleimani, aside from being an Iranian military hero, was also a politician and regarded by many observers as likely to be a future leader of Iran. In the West, many have claimed he supported terrorism, and the Pentagon says Soleimani and his forces have been responsible for hundreds of American deaths. But now President Trump's decision to assassinate him due to an alleged imminent threat to U.S. interests is already having major repercussions across the region. Joining us now to give their assessment of some of what those repercussions might be are Evo Dalder. He is president of the Chicago Council of Global Affairs and the former U.S. ambassador to NATO from 2009 to 2013. Jacqueline Saper, an Iranian-American author who witnessed the Iranian Revolution in 1979, who fled to the United States in 87. She is the author of From Miniskirt to Hijab, A Girl in Revolutionary Iran. And John Mearsheimer, political science professor at the University of Chicago, where he specializes in foreign policy and international relations. Welcome all of you, Thank you. to Great. Chicago tonight. Evo Dalder. Your assessment of the president's decision to assassinate Soleimani. Well, Soleimani is certainly a man who had the blood of thousands on his hand, and his demi demise is not something we should uh, be too concerned about. But as a strategic foreign policy matter, the fact that we could take him out doesn't make it a wise decision. And indeed, we are already seeing the repercussions uh, in two fundamental ways. One, we're being drawn into the Middle East the very place that President Trump said we wanted to get out of. We sent another 3,500 troops uh, from Fort Bragg into the, into the country, and we will now be part of the Middle East and, make, and, and continue to be uh, engaged there. And secondly, the Iranians, even without retaliating, are starting to making some big strategic uh, gains. The Iraqi parliament, of course, voted to uh, end the foreign uh, presence of, of military troops, including U.S. troops. Uh, which are now preparing to at least talking about preparing of getting out. Uh, the Iranian nuclear program is being accelerated. Uh, and the, inside Iran, uh, the hardliners are consolidating power and the reformers are, are losing out. Uh, all strategic gains for Iran, for Iran and, the, and the leadership that Soleimani represented and a big negative for the United States. John Mearsheimer, there are many times in this broadcast that you and Mr. Dalder disagree on this count do you disagree? No, I was hoping you would ask me that same question first, so I could have said almost exactly what he said. I agree with him. You think it is surprising, disastrous, A and B? What? I'm actually surprised that Trump did it because it is so foolish. Uh, it should have been obvious to him beforehand uh, that it was not going to lead to any good. Uh, I mean, he's been actually remarkably cautious about using military force up to this point, and all for the good. Uh, he's not been able to get us out of these forever wars, but he's at least not escalated them in any meaningful way. And in this case, he's escalating it in a serious way, as Evo said, and it's going to have very negative consequences. Very important to understand, Carol, that what has started this whole ball rolling is when Trump, in May of 2018, pulled out of the nuclear agreement that the Obama administration had, had reached with Iran. And we decided, Trump decided, that we were going to put maximum pressure on the Iranians and we were going to force them by inflicting so much pain on them to throw their hands up and to surrender to us, give up their nuclear program completely, stop testing ballistic missiles, radically alter their foreign policy and so forth and so on. And it's not working. The policy is obviously not working. So what we're doing here is upping the ante. 
we're doubling down. And the question you have to ask yourself, is this going to make the situation better for, or worse? And I think apropos what Evo said, you're going to make the situation worse. Ms. Saper, I know that you've been in this country for 30 years, yes. but you have many family members yes, still do. in Iran. When was the last time you spoke with them? I spoke with them uh, yesterday. I have friends and family in Iran. The means of communication is Skype or WhatsApp. It's a very popular app. Um, obviously, Iran is polarized right now. Soleimani was not a hero for everybody. Um, many Iranians are against the regime. There were mass protests in 100 cities just a month ago where the Iranian regime and government killed, by estimate, 1,500 of their own civilians. And there are many of the murdered people couldn't even have a funeral. Uh, what I spoke on the, with my family, uh, obviously as an American, Amer uh, Iranian, Iranian American, like many others, uh, I'm straddled between two worlds. Uh, we are all concerned about the safety of our loved ones over there. Um, but uh, I believe um, we don't know if the repercussions are good or bad, what this is good or bad. And yet, when you talk about it being polarized in Iran, mm -hmm. at the same time we saw this massive outpouring in the streets of Iran, mm -hmm. uh, Ayatollah Khamenei weeping, and it yeah, looked like there was a, a sense of I Iran unity. Has, Iran has 83 million population. Let's say 8 million go in the streets. That's only 10% of the population. So, but, but there's a lot of evidence that this is bringing Iranians together it's because it's a the threat. Elite. It's bringing the elite together, the reformists, the hardliners, the, the, the leaders, because Soleimani was uh, above all these fac factions. He was not a cleric. I think he would have become the next president of Iran. He was the second, more or less, second most powerful person in the country. The po there are posters of him. I saw pictures of him. I watch Iranian TV. Evo, do you think so? Do you think that he would have been uh, an up and coming? Uh, I'll defer to somebody who knows who knows Iranian domestic politics. But I, I do think, and this is important, uh, that the hardliners have now won the big political battle inside, mm -hmm. I, inside Iraq, uh, Iran for, uh, for power. There are parliamentary elections and presidential elections coming up. Uh, it is inconceivable to me that at this point you could have another Rouhani, uh, as we've had, who, who relatively speaking is a reformist. Mm -hmm. uh, and you will find somebody who was very close to Ayatollah Khamenei, who was, of course, the man who, uh, who taunted uh, and, uh, uh, the, the president of the United States, uh, which is maybe one of the reasons why uh, uh, President Trump decided to strike in the way he did. But just to add to this, it was also clear up until very recently that Iran's influence in Iraq was waning. Exactly. And the Iraqis were very angry with Soleimani and the Iranians more generally. And yeah. if anything, what this does is cut in the other direction and it pushes the Iranians and the Iraqis together. And furthermore, it undermines the political situation in Iraq, which is disastrous for us. What, what happens with us in the sense of is there in any way the likelihood of a ground war in which we would see troops in Iran? No. I don't think so. No. no. I don't think Iranian so I, people won. I, I think the chances are, are, are slim, yeah. but they're bigger today than they were a week ago. Uh, you don't really know how a situation like this might get out of control. We do have an administration that uh, likes to be unpredictable, but sometimes can be unpredictable in ways that are self-defeating, as we see in this particular case. I don't think it's likely. I think John's right that President Trump is the kind of guy who doesn't like to use military force as much as he likes to talk about it. Uh, I think one of the reasons he took this option is because it had low collateral damage. Uh, the, the, the chances that other people being affected, uh, besides the ones who, who he was targeting, were small. Uh, some of the other options on the table, which some military people may have seen as less uh, uh, gra uh, uh, grand uh, than this one, uh, in fact, might have had greater impact on the, on the population. Uh, our, th our allies were not pre-warned, as far as we know. Just the Israelis. Just the Israelis. And uh, I, I meant to say European allies, European but thank you for that, that yes. But is there a consequence to that that we're going to feel 
in well, the next few days and weeks? Our relations with the Europeans are terrible at the moment, and this just makes a bad situation worse. The fact is, if you go around the world and you talk to our allies and you talk to people in all sorts of other countries, they think the United States is basically out of control when it comes to foreign policy, and they just scratch their head and wonder what Trump is doing. Uh, so if anything, I think what this is going to do is drive an even bigger wedge between the United States and the Europeans. Our, our but, allies have troops in Iraq today but I, uh, under a NATO mission to train Iraqi forces. Uh, NATO called a, uh, an emergency meeting to today. We have ended the, the, the uh, training of those troops, and the Allied troops are now being pulled to Kuwait. Uh, that's the result. It's the pullback of other countries that are no longer being willing to be side by side with the United States for the danger that that represents to their security. But Iran's rhetoric is very strong. The, I don't, sometimes I think it's just a hollow drum. I don't think their actions will be as strong as their rhetoric. Iran has never attacked American soil. It will, it's always been proxy wars. And I'm more concerned about Ismail Qa'ani, the replacement of Soleimani. He is not as charismatic or experienced as Soleimani was. So we will have to see. But um, I know that Iran is making the most out of this among their own people. Um, there are many, uh, they're incorporating Soleimani's life and martyrdom. He's being revered as a martyr in the school curriculum. They're going to uh, show him as a role model to children. And uh, they're re renaming many stadiums. The Ahwaz International Airport is named in him. Resalat Highway is named in his, uh, renamed in his name. Uh, we shall see. But, uh, so, but, but I think, Jacqueline, they have to retaliate. They will definitely retaliate. Right. And, and then the question the, is, what is Trump going to do? He will retaliate. Well, and we this one just continues not, to ratchet up. We hope it will up. not go up like And that. do we think that that retaliation is in a cybersecurity approach be. or in some other kind of proxy war? I mean, what is, what is Iran's retaliation? It can, be many, it can be many things, but if the Iranians are listening and paying attention, not doing anything will get them greater gains than doing something. In Iraq, this political situation is already turning in their favor. If we leave Iraq, they will have more influence. If we leave Iraq, we won't be able to sustain our military presence in Syria. They will have greater influence in Syria. They are already consolidating power at home, the hardliners, in terms of what they're trying to do. And they're now expanding their nuclear program. And it's not the Europeans blaming the, uh, the Iranians for that. They're blaming the United States for that. But Those are gains that you can have without even doing anything. Correct. If, if, Last if, word. If, the United, if, Iran and United, if Iran incorporates a war with the United States, I think they're committing suicide. It cannot, they cannot even compare to the United States. Evo Dalder, Jacqueline Saper, and John Mearsheimer, thank you always for being with us. You're welcome. I have thank a feeling we're going to be talking more and more often. Thank you. There is more ahead on Chicago Tonight. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the City Club of Chicago. Smart people may disagree about what makes a great city, but part of what makes Chicago great is that we don't have to agree. To run a city like ours, a lot of issues come up. The City Club of Chicago is a place to debate those issues and hear from the men and women who shape the policies, lead the industries, and tell the stories that define our city. For the free and open exchange of ideas, the City Club of Chicago. We are watching in real time as an underground market suddenly goes above board. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here with a look at the growing business of weed. Amanda, how big is this pot, so to speak? <laughs> Good joke there, Paris. No, it was I a like terrible that joke. One. I'm sorry. I like that. <laughs> Don't give it credit where it doesn't deserve any. <laughs> you know, Paris, really, the marijuana industry is in its infancy. Even the more senior companies in this field are just a few or a handful of years old, really. So it's hard to tell at this point what the industry will look like when it grows up, if you will. It is clear that this is an industry where there's opportunity for growth. Those hours long lines outside marijuana dispensaries made that at least more than apparent. But the business of cannabis gets complicated quickly for a very simple reason. Even though it's legal in Illinois, the federal government still considers marijuana a prohibited drug. Morningstar analyst Christopher Inton says that presents a challenge. There's a lot of institutional investors that 
typically would invest in a company that's showing this kind of growth and opportunity, but won't because there's both uh, federal illegality and sort of the stigma behind it still, right? The dilemma is that marijuana businesses want to, at this point in time, of course, grow as fast as possible, but without access to traditional forms of banking, they have a hard time getting the capital they need to do so. So what are the alternative ways that they raise money? In says typically at this stage, young companies would look to venture capitalists. They tend to have patience, they're investing and willing to take a loss early on with the hope of making a return in the long run, say a decade down the road. But instead, because they can't do that, some of the big players in the cannabis industry went public. Because they do sell THC products in the U.S., Chicago-based companies like Cresco Labs and Green Thumb Industries cannot be listed on the American stock exchanges. They are part of the Canadian stock exchange. Likewise, you have Canadian cannabis companies going public in the U.S. And how are those companies performing? As a general rule, by the end of 2019, not so hot. Hmm. The second half of the year, many stocks were cut in half, if not more. Um, it was dramatic. Uh, it literally looks like a tent where the first half, a lot of hype. Second half, uh, especially as these companies report earnings, uh, the Canadians especially, uh, the stocks tumble. He says public markets can be finicky and want to see quick returns. Investors seem to be disappointed with the lack of early growth or profitability, even though he says that shouldn't really be expected again at this early stage. And this is still just a budding industry. I'm sorry. It's going to the grow. The puns keep coming. There are yeah. going to be more permits. So what, what does the future hold for investors or for the potential here? Analysts do predict that 2020 could see marijuana stocks climb back up again, including in part because of legalization in Illinois. Now, our Morning Star analyst says it's tough to predict in a volatile market like this, but he does expect growth in both revenue and profit, albeit small. Also, more mergers. We have already seen heavy consolidation in that industry. Only a few of the marijuana dispensaries in the Chicago area are independently run. Most are multi-state operators. Now, one other factor to consider, marijuana companies, especially in Illinois, do benefit from the state's intense regulation. Illinois is issuing only limited licenses to grow and to sell cannabis. When I toured Revolution's Cultivation Center in downstate Delavan recently, I asked the CEO whether winning one of these licenses from the state is basically a way to print another form of green. I don't agree with the concept that a license has anything to do with a license to print money, and I'll tell you why. Number one, there's always going to be legislative or legal um, changes. The bigger risk, he says, is not knowing what the federal government might, might not do and what that could mean for his company and for all of the industry. Now, one Chicago dispensary was on the receiving end of the risky side of the business today. Chicago police say the Mocha dispensary in Logan Square was burglarized. Offenders got in a side door, possibly with a key card, and took an unknown amount of cash. You know, Paris Mocha was one of the many marijuana pot shops that was closed for business today. Some just had no more product to sell. Others said they wanted to give their workers a break after those busy first few days. So lesson here, it's a new industry, but a risky industry right now, especially for investors and owners. And a whole lot of people still looking to get into that industry as well. All right, Amanda, thank you very mm -hmm. much. And make sure to check out our website for a guide to marijuana in Illinois. There you can find details on the state's law, a map of dispensaries, and much more information that's updated pretty frequently. And you can find the guide at WTTW.com slash pot guide. And we'll hear some of your thoughts on recreational marijuana sales later in the program, so stick around for that. The Army confirms the death of a local soldier killed in an overseas terrorist attack. Brandis Friedman has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Brandis. In Paris, a Chicago area soldier has been identified among the three people killed in an attack on a U.S. military base in Kenya yesterday. Today, the Department of Defense confirmed the death of 23-year-old Army Specialist Henry Mitch Mayfield Jr. from Evergreen Park, Illinois. Mayfield joined the Army in 2017 and was assigned to Fort Rucker in Alabama. The attack happened at Manda Bay Airfield in Kenya, where several U.S. aircraft and vehicles were destroyed. The extremist group Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility. In a statement, the Army calls Specialist Mayfield a, dyna a dynamic soldier who inspired those he served.
You may not have to pay for your next red light camera ticket depending on where you live. Illinois Comptroller Susanna Mendoza says her office will stop helping municipalities collect fines against drivers who are ticketed by cameras. They were sold as a way to prevent motorists racing through the intersections. But the stories have shown that they are now more about charging people high fines for failing to come to a complete stop as they make a right turn on red at intersections where right turns on red are allowed. Mendoza says her office collected $11 million in revenue for municipalities last year, but the $100 tickets, which can double if not paid on time, may disproportionately impact poor and minority drivers. She, she also notes a federal corruption probe into relationships between some communities and a red light vendor. A trip downtown might cost you more depending on when you're going and who you're going with. The city's new congestion tax goes into effect today. If you're taking a solo Uber, Lyft or Via ride downtown between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m., the tax is $3. It's 8 if you're going to the airports, Navy Pier or McCormick Place. But if you choose to share your ride, the tax for riding downtown is just a buck 25. The city says it's launching a new campaign today to encourage riders to use more shared rides through the hashtag choose shared. City says it's aiming to reduce gridlock on downtown roadways and encourage other transit options when available. As for the weather tonight, slight chance of flurries with a low around 29. Tomorrow, another chance of morning flurries, then mostly sunny with a high near 39 degrees. Now Paris back to you. Thank you, Brandis. And still to come on Chicago tonight, the Chicago Public Schools Inspector General is here to talk about uncovering wrongdoing in the district with some limited resources. The latest on the bushfires raging in Australia and an update on Chicago's abnormally mild winter so far. A specialist on Iranian culture reacts to President Trump's recent threat to attack 52 Iranian sites. A Chicago photographer reminds us that the trendy River North area had a much grittier past. A visit to the Native American jewelry exhibit at the Mitchell Museum of the American Indian. And we hear your thoughts about the first day of recreational marijuana sales in tonight's viewer feedback. But first, some of today's top business headlines from Cranes. Here's editor Ann Dwyer. Thanks, Paris. After selling like gangbusters on the first day that recreational marijuana sales were legal in Illinois, the volume dropped off a bit through the weekend. New data from state regulators indicates that sales of legal marijuana in Illinois dropped on Thursday and through Sunday, but people were still waiting in lines to buy. Sales over the five days totaled $10.8 million. Retailers are warning that supplies, particularly of smokable buds or flour, would be tight. Some shops ran out and are hurrying to restock. Meanwhile, Ford Motor Company's fourth quarter U.S. sales fell more than expected. Bloomberg reports that fewer deliveries of the automaker's redesigned Explorer was a reason for the decline. Explorer sales plunged 15 percent in the quarter, a disappointing result in what is otherwise the hottest segment of the U.S. market. The Explorer's poor fourth quarter showing follows a 48 percent decline in the third quarter. Bloomberg analysts say Ford has struggled to launch the redesigned Explorer at its Chicago factory, resulting in costly production delays. But the pace picked up in December, which analysts hope means sales will improve in the first quarter of 2020. And finally, the owners of a 19th century mansion in Hyde Park are seeking a record price for the neighborhood. Originally built in 1899 and now an 8,000-square-foot, six-bedroom mansion, this house in the 5,500 block of South Woodlawn Avenue is priced at $4.2 million, the highest anyone has paid for a home in Hyde Park, and in fact for a home anywhere in the city south of Roosevelt Road is $3.75 million. We'll be watching to see what the property ultimately fetches. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann Dwyer. Back to you, Paris. Thanks, Ann. And now back to Brandis and Chicago Public Schools Watchdog. Brandis. Thanks, Paris. Hundreds of claims of sexual misconduct 
millions of dollars in potential mismanagement and dozens of complaints of staff residency violations. All those issues and many others lie at the heart of the latest annual report from the Chicago Public Schools Inspector General, the watchdog charged with overseeing the city's massive school district. Joining us with more on the report is Nicholas Schuler, Chicago Public Schools Inspector General. Welcome back to Chicago tonight. Thank you. So this report covers the first work done by your office's new sexual allegations unit. Um, in fiscal year 2019, you opened 458 sexual allegation cases and completed 136 investigations. As a result of your investigations, 36 people are no longer employed with CPS and 15 are facing criminal charges. How do you feel about these results? Are you satisfied? Well, you know, I think, uh, yes, I think we're satisfied. Uh, it, this, the story of the last 18 months in our office has been um, the, the build up to this, the hiring of uh, this, this unit, which has uh, become quite large. We're going to be 27, 28 people when we're fully staffed. We've got a couple more positions to hire for. And so, uh, you know, I think it was surprising because when we first started doing this and we were working with Maggie Hickey, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the attorney that the board had hired to kind of do an initial review, as we were trying to figure out how many people this would take, we originally thought we could do this with 8, 10, I think I was pushing for 12 originally, you know, to just be sure we had enough. But uh, the, the volume of the complaints has been, um, you know, very, very steady. We're getting basically three, three we're opening three cases a uh, school day on average. And uh, so there's a, the, the volume of the complaints has been uh, pretty high. Um, and so the, I mean, that's, been, that's been the story on dedicating the resources to that, getting people trained, finding people to do this, getting the right mix of people to do this. And do you have the resources that you need? Because in every annual report, you mention the size of your budget compared to that of the district you're in charge of, of overseeing. Do you have what you need to do this job? So, I mean, if we're talking about sexual, the sexual allegations piece, um, you know, I, I, think that, I think yes, that's a qualified yes for now. The board, uh, the board always asks me if uh, we need more people. So I'm trying to do this uh, the right way with, you know, we're trying to be efficient um, I, and we're trying to get the right mix. And if I think we need more people, uh, we'll ask for more. And then uh, if we talk about kind of our traditional operation that we had before, no, I think that's understaffed and we need more people there. Um, before this unit, sexual misconduct claims were handled by the, um, the district's law department, which also defended the district from right. lawsuits, which we've talked about this before. It's an apparent uh, conflict. Are there other changes that you would like to see in how CPS handles these cases? Well, I think in, importantly, you know, the fact that we're doing this, the fact that we're reporting on it, we're, you know, we've been giving quarterly reports about the data and the amount of cases, so people, people know that. And then what's happening is that there's be, between our office and the Office of Student Protections, which provides student supports and is uh, aggregating the data from, from these cases as well as the ones that they're uh, investigating involving students, on students, um, we're actually getting real numbers on, on uh, you know, the, 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 the allegations, the, the, uh, who they're against, and this is being tracked. And there's a lot of, so importantly, there's a lot of kind of uh, lower level cases that maybe even on their face don't, uh, uh, aren't, you know, they're not sexual on their face, but we've got, we have a student, we have an adult complaining about behavior that's, that's creepy. Maybe it's... Grooming. Uh, well, or grooming or it could be grooming or just that they're, somebody's creeping them out in a way. And so we're, we're, we're dedicating a lot of resources to that, investigating that, and, um, you know, it might be a training issue. It might be, uh, we might not be able to sustain it. We might not, be not, we might not know what happens, but at least we're, we're identifying these people, and if there's a second complaint, we'll be able to drill down more and, you know, uh, you know I guess, God forbid, a third complaint. Um, the report also covers, this one covers, a CPS principal forcing a teacher into sex. Now, cases involving students are usually outside of your purview. Why, why take on this one? I'm sorry, you know, adults on a, we, we handle adult on a uh, student uh, all the time. And this, okay. this, I think this is sort of um, just, I, th I think uh, we've, we're kind of developing an expertise. We're independent. And uh, I think between uh, our office and, and jointly with, with uh, the, the board, we decided that we were the best people to, to handle that one. Um, financial mismanagement in the port as well, of course. Uh, Whitney Young, swim coach, rented out the school's pool and kept the money. How did that happen? Uh, so we didn't identify anyone in the report uh, or the school, but... Uh, but it's been re reported it, outside, it, of course. It, it has. Um, so uh, what's troubling about that case is that there had been an original case where um, this, this coach had been using this, the pool facilities basically for a private swim club at a very... Uh, you know, very nominal rate, which we, we and uh, we hadn't gone through um, uh, contracting a central office. It was sort of a side deal at a very, very nominal rate. 
And in the wake of that, uh, the coach was, uh, he wasn't working at CPS anymore. And there was, um, uh, uh, there was a period of debarment, but then we had allegations that he was back and is, is, and actually letting the, uh, the pool time out to other private companies. So, uh, so basically he was leasing time that he was, he, uh, he had an agreement to sort of be at the school, he was leasing that time, and he was leasing times that were wholly unconnected to the times he was supposed to be there. And over a period of three, three and a half years, something like that, he pocketed $30,000. Uh, and he, So he wasn't, he was leasing this time and not giving the money back to the CPS. And then in that instance, you faulted the principal and recommended serious discipline or possible termination, um, but she only received a five-day suspension. What kind of message do you think that sends? Well, you know, I mean, you know, uh, uh, that's concerning to us. You know, we, we recommended, you know, serious suspension uh, or termination. So five days is certainly at the weekend. It's, it is concerning about the message that sends, and especially since this was sort of the second time, and we concluded that um, the principal knew or, or should have known about this, although the, the principal denied it. Um, and before I let you go, uh, an annual problem that appears in your report, residency, 140 complaints of residency violations. You ID'd 15 instances of fraud where you recommended termination or an employee resigned. Why is this such a persistent problem? Well, you know, I, I, I think there's just some people who don't want to live in the city. That's why it's a problem. Um, but, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, it's, just, it's, it's fairness. I think a lot of other people who uh, are living in the city complying with the rule uh, feel that, you know, they might want to move or they might want to do something differently. So uh, I think that's where we get a lot of complaints. I think, we're, you know, we get a lot of anonymous complaints, but I think they're <laughs> quite often from other uh, employees who see, see the unfairness. Okay. Nick Schuler, thank you again for joining us. My pleasure. And you can read the CPS Inspector General's annual report on our website. Coming up, Paris talks with an atmospheric scientist about the Australian bushfires and local weather. Stay with us. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. We have a tremendous source of untapped efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. Record-setting bushfires are causing destruction all across Australia. The fires have destroyed millions of acres, forced people from their homes, and killed an estimated half a billion animals. So what's behind the inferno's intensity and longevity? Here to unpack this story, as well as talk about our unseasonably warm weather, is Scott Collis, an atmospheric scientist at Argonne National Laboratory. Welcome back, Scott. Thank you, Paris. Sorry, under these circumstances, the numbers are staggering here. 14 million acres reported uh, under fire, half a billion animals spanning the entire country. What is the latest that you're hearing right now about the conditions and the situation? I think the best word is catastrophic. Now remember, Australia's population is around 20 million, so many, many more times the number of animals has been killed than the number of people who live in the country. Fortunately, there has been a little bit of rainfall across the southeast corner of Australia, which is where the most intense fires have occurred and the winds have died down. But this has actually given firefighters a little bit of a respite, although temperatures are expected to warm and winds increase later in the week. And you are from Australia. You have family and friends there. That's How correct. are they doing? They're doing OK. Fortunately, most of my family live near some of the big city centres, so not surrounded by the kind of forests that um, are being burnt. I actually studied at the Australian National University in Canberra, Australia. Australia, the university has been shut down this week because of terrible air quality because people can't even go outside in Canberra right now because it's dangerous to breathe the air. Canberra in New South Wales, which in, is where Sydney is. It's and in, it's in uh, the Australian Capital Territory, mm -hmm. which is like our Washington, D.C., right. halfway between Melbourne and Sydney. Gotcha. Um, and bushfires are normal in Australia, but... Uh, tell us what is causing this uh, fire on this kind of magnitude. Not only are they normal in Australia, they're actually very important in our ecosystems to uh, generate regrowth. However, we've seen very unusual weather patterns in Australia over the last two or so years. Weather is influenced by climate, and climate is influenced by our oceans and different oscillations in the oceans. And there are two, and I'm going to put some science in here, two very important oscillations in Australia. One is called the Indian Ocean Dipole. It controls the thunderstorms that we see in the Northern Territory, and one is called the Southern Annular Mode, or SAM, which controls the strength of the western
westerly winds. The Indian Ocean Dipole has been suppressing those thunderstorms in the north, which has meant all the air up in the north has been really, really dry, and the southern annular mode has been pulling these westerly winds up over Australia. Add a three-year drought to that, and you've got closed dryer like conditions that is making all the fuel for the fire, all the fallen leaves and logs, tinder dry, just waiting to go up. To put this in the perspective for us, when is the last time this country saw something on this magnitude? Well, we're yet to tally up all the cost, but what we're looking at right now is probably never. This is unprecedented. And what role is warming temperatures in the Earth's atmosphere playing here? So no one event can be attributed to global warming or climate change. However, it does tilt the playing field and it does tend to make things like the Indian Ocean Dipole more extreme and suppress those thunderstorms more. That's why we're using Earth system models like the ones being developed at the United States Department of Energy to try to predict what the role of climate change will be in these future patterns. And one thing we know is that Australia, because it's surrounded by an ocean, tends to feel these impacts more so than landlocked countries like the United States. You mentioned that some of the firefighters have a bit of a respite because there's some rain. Mm -hmm. what, what do you see as the way out here? Is there a way out in, in the foreseeable future? It's very hard to predict because the problem is that you need lots of moderate to light rainfall. Once these fires have burnt, they leave, they clear out the undergrowth. And so if you had drenching rains all of a sudden, it tends to strip out all the plant roots and the things that are required for regrowth. This is coming on the, well, what we hope will be the end, fingers crossed, of a three year drought. So we need long drenching rainfall for this to be over but long term. As you mentioned in Australia, it's the beginning of their hot season right now. That is correct. We're only in January right now. This is typically about the same time of the year when we start seeing fire danger increase and folks start getting worried. There's still a lot of summer to go. How much damage is permanent here? That is a tricky question. The Australian bush is a very complicated um, uh, ecosystem. There are many different systems that rely on each other. Some of the severe bushfires back in you know, the early 2000s took they're still areas are still recovering now from it. You're still getting that old growth forest back. All right, so while, while this plays out um, half a world away, we here are dealing with a, a relatively mild winter. What are the factors behind that? So our weather systems tend to ride around on these train tracks of upper level winds. And right now we have this big roller coaster that's sending um, cold air up to the north of the country. So folks like uh, Seattle might be seeing snow in Vancouver. However, down over Chicago, we're actually getting warm air that's coming up over the Pacific and up over the Californian ranges, which is tend to give us a, a very moderate um, wet um, uh, winter. Um, but, you know, one of the interesting factors here is we've had very little snowfall. December usually sees about 8.2 inches of snow. We've only seen two inches in winter. And when you've got no snow, as the days get longer and longer, the sun is going to warm that, dry, that uh, clear ground more and more. And so that could impact uh, the rest of the winter. I mean, we could see a, a milder February, March. It could. One nice thing about when you're in extreme warmth, Chances are, if you're a betting man, you'd say it'll probably get cooler as those railroad tracks shift along and we start getting some cold air from up north to down here. However, that cold air has to pass over a lot of bare ground and a lot of warming of that air could occur. So you, if you were a betting man, you would say we're going to see more uh, normal temperatures for this time we'll, of year. We'll go soon. back more towards normal. However, I would say on average we're looking at a warmer than average winter. All right, Scott Collins, thank you very much. Thank you, Paris. Well, the area we call River North now offers a trendy mix of restaurants, bars, and galleries. But it wasn't always that way, especially one stretch of North Clark Street. Chicago photographer and filmmaker Tom Palazzolo captured that area in those days like no one else. Jay Shevsky has his story. Walking around here now is very, very uh, surreal. Except for a few places, uh, everything has changed. Of course, it's been 50 years. It was 1962 then, I think, that I moved there, taking a photo class and looking for subject matter, and there it was, uh, right outside the door. 
Tom Palazzolo was 25 when he moved here. He'd come to Chicago to study at the School of the Art Institute. The apartment at Clark and Hubbard was cheap, but that wasn't all that drew him. Clark Street was totally unique. Just that stretch from the river all the way to Chicago Avenue. You know, it was colorful, I guess. It was, uh, you know, it had lots of bars. Uh, almost every corner, if it didn't have a greasy spoon, it had a bar. There were at least two, maybe three burlesque houses. Right here was Moeller Barber College. I'd go in, get my haircuts for uh, 50 cents. There were about 10 barber students. I knew them all, and they were jokers and cut-ups, and so to speak. Uh, was that a bad pun? A cut uh, oh, uh. Abe Lincoln would come in uh, every so often and get a trim. They said uh, Abe was not a good tipper. It was uh, strange. Tom was inspired by early photographers like Lewis Hine. Photographs of people who, you know, were low end of the economic scale. I, I was interested in following that kind of tradition. I got good feedback from the photographs in class. Now, and then I graduated in 65. Uh, and I continued to photograph uh, and even film the area a, a bit. A lot of friends would take pictures of the loop, and that never interested me, you know, uh, uh, at all. Tom Palazzolo went on to be known primarily as an experimental filmmaker, turning his lens on the grittier sides of Chicago. Tom came to the Midwestern city of Chicago as a struggling art student. And he was the subject of a film, which included his work along Clark Street. When you're in an area like that, uh, people tend to be more open. You know, if I went into the loop and tried to shoot people, they, you know, they would have, uh, God knows what, called the police or something. Uh, as you can see, some of the people were alcoholics and it is part of the street, of what the street was like. This was a diner, it was an all-night diner, the only one I knew of that was open all night. And I would go in there for coffee, uh, and that's where I met Carol Ann, uh, who sadly was dying of ALS, uh, and only lived about a year after I got to meet her. I felt like I was sort of privileged to be in that area for some reason. Privileged in that it offered me something expressive to work with. It, it was a place that I could empathize with. And now that this stretch of Clark Street is just another part of trendy River North, Tom Palazzolo's photos help us remember our past. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shevsky. Tom Palazzolo lived in the area for 10 years until 1972. Now many of his Clark Street photos have been collected into a new book called Clark Street. It's only available through a few independent bookstores. You can find out more on our website, where we've also got a slideshow of Tom's photos and links to many of his experimental films. And now we go back to Brandis with a deeper look into the president's threat to target Iranian culture sites. Brandis. Paris, Iran is considered a cradle of civilization. Relics of the region's ancient societies dating back thousands of years have contributed greatly to the understanding of history and culture. Over the weekend, President Trump tweeted that he's, quote, targeted 52 Iranian sites, some of which he says are important to Iranian culture, in the case of an attack from Iran. The threat has not only raised questions about international laws of war, but also historical preservation. Joining us is a specialist on Iranian culture and history, Professor Emeritus Matthew Stolper from the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. 
So as someone who studied Iranian cultures and worked on excavations in Iran, what was your reaction to the president's tweet? Everybody, every scholar of the ancient Middle East for the last 30 years has had to come to terms again and again with devastating destruction of the monuments and even the primary evidence of the things that we have been struggling to illuminate for our entire lives. And the egregious um, offenders, people who were able to destroy in ways that no ancient army could ever do, were things like the Taliban blowing up the Bamiyan Buddhas or the uh, ISIS fighters destroying Assyrian palaces and Roman temples. Um, the idea that some of the leaders of my country would threaten, even just threaten, even think of doing such a thing is to me dismaying, disappointing, um, infuriating. So broadly speaking, what can you tell us, uh, for those of us who are less familiar with Iranian culture, about its significance uh, with regards to, so it's been called sort of a cradle of civilization. You're right, it was part of one of the cradles of civilization. Culture goes back in Iran for as long as there was culture. Some of the first crops and animals that were domesticated were domesticated in territories that are now part of Iran. Some of the earliest cities came about in parts of what is now Iran. Some of the earliest writing was developed in parts of what is now Iran. Other monuments from Iran were the keys to deciphering the writings of antiquity that opened up thousands of years of previously unknown history. Uh, the empires that were based in Iran when they confronted uh, the states of Greece and Rome were significant in forming the identity of what we now think of as the West, as Western civilization. In the early modern time of Europe, the relationships between European states and Iran were intimate relationships of commerce, diplomacy, um, import, export, and armaments. Uh, in modern times, in the 18th and 19th century, Iranian literature and Iranian art became extremely influential in much of European intellectual history. But after a while, oil became important, and I think we started to pay more attention to the resources than to the literature. So an important archaeological site in Iran, it's the ancient city of Persepolis. Um, tell us why this place is significant. Well, Persepolis is especially dear to people at the Oriental Institute and in Chicago because much of what you see now at the site of Persepolis is the result of excavations carried out by the Oriental Institute uh, in the 1930s. Uh, Persepolis was built uh, under the King Darius I sometime around 520 BC. It was um, added to by all of his successors, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and so on, until it was sacked and destroyed by Alexander the Great and his troops, um, leaving a smoldering ruin in almost perfect condition. It was conspicuous as a visible above-ground ruin, so that European travelers began describing it as early as the 14th century. And from the 17th century on, it became an increasing focus of information and attention. It's, it's inscriptions on the walls of the palaces of Persepolis that made possible the first steps in deciphering uh, the cuneiform scripts, which in turn made it possible to unlock the civilizations of Babylonia, Assyria, Sumer, uh, Syria, Anatolia, thousands of years of lost history. Um, even now, documents from Persepolis that we're working on at the Oriental Institute are producing vast amounts of new information about the structure of the empire and the civilization of ancient Iran. It's a site of immeasurable importance. The art of uh, on the walls of the palaces of Iran stunned uh, people in Europe and America when it was revealed in the 1930s and it continues to overwhelm visitors today. So as someone who's spent time in Iran, you've gotten to know its people, it, what is their connection to this culture and how might those folks receive a threat like the one the president has made? Uh, they'll be shocked, startled, offended. Um, every 
adult in Iran. And almost all school children in Iran can recite vast amounts of the classical poetry of the Persian language, of Hafez, Saadi, Rumi, Omar Hayam, in a way that is stunning to an American visitor whose depth of grasp of his own literature tends to be a little bit looser. But it's important, I think, to remember that the heirs of Iranian cultural heritage are not just the citizens of the modern Islamic Republic of Iran. They include um, speakers of Iranian languages elsewhere in Afghanistan and Tajikistan. They include Zoroastrians, Parsis from Mumbai, and Zoro Zoro Zoroastrians in America as well. And above all, they include Iranian Americans who are Americans uh, in the same way that the German descendants of Germans like me and like President Trump are American. So that culture is important to us all. Professor Matthew Stolper, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. An exhibit at the Mitchell Museum of the American Indian in Evanston features more than 80 pieces of Native American jewelry revealing the history of their culture and spiritual beliefs. Arts correspondent Angel Edo recently shared how this wearable art helps preserve indigenous stories in the museum's Stunning Stories in Native American Jewelry exhibit. Here's another look. For generations, Native American artists have passed down design techniques to enhance the beauty of their jewelry. In creating jewelry to gift, trade, and sell amongst other tribes, their goal has always been to make sure the stories of indigenous people live forever. Sharing these stories really keep the culture, the spirituality, all of that alive for people. When you learn more about another culture, you're less likely to um, act against it. When you learn about it, you learn to respect it. You understand why it's important to other people to sustain their practices. So that sharing and educating that we do just by wearing a piece of jewelry can be really powerful. Now, American history can be seen all throughout this exhibit, including these U.S. coins repurposed for a necklace. The practice of melting silver coins to create jewelry was utilized during World War II so that Southwestern artists could work and earn a living on reservations. By the early 19th century, the U.S. government banned certain practices of indigenous spirituality. Many tribes were forced to convert to Christianity. And while this ban was lifted in 1978, artists still blend symbols of Native American spirituality in their work to keep their spirituality hidden in plain sight. This piece here is called a storyteller belt, and this was made by Denise Wallace, who's a Lucian. She creates these beautiful belts that talk about their culture, and this is a women and children's belt. Mm. Each of these figures is actually detachable mm -hmm. in part so that you can wear uh, like the little child on the woman, um, you could wear that as a pin. Mm. There's also the centerpiece, the oval piece that's um, made out of ivory, carved ivory with some scrimshaw uh, markings to make the face. That pops out as a pendant and then there's a cut out silverwork design underneath that. A that's lot of native so artists do that cool. with their jewelry. They make it very multifaceted oh, so that wow. you can actually wear pieces. The artists were also resourceful with what they used to create jewelry. Repurposed animals can be seen throughout the exhibit from a necklace made of bear claws to bolos made with porcupine quills. Many pieces feature blends of bright colors created from either crushed stones or ornate beading. One museum goer says it's an attention to detail that is not often seen anymore. Handmade is very different than the mass manufactured jewelry that we see so often. So I think it is just a reminder to, you know, appreciate the, the intricacy and the handwork of each piece. We have a lot of figures that are uh, part of Native American legends, katsinas, or other deities in Native culture. And most of this work is uh, silver with stone inlay. So they would have had um, someone creating the background silver piece and then someone else would have cut the individual stones. So each color change is a new stone and they would have to be carved very specifically to fit within those space or fit butted up against one another to create a very smooth piece. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. And if you're interested in taking a closer look at some of that jewelry, visit our website for more information.
Before we go, though, some viewer feedback. Dispensaries across the city and state began selling recreational marijuana on New Year's Day, totaling more than $3 million in sales on the first day. Many of you shared your thoughts on that, plus the news coverage of those sales. Hope this money does something good for Illinois and not to politicians' pockets. After the insane taxes Illinois is charging, this will soon turn into just a tourist-targeted industry. I'll stick to the black market, thank you. I don't know if I'm alone on this. I, for one, would like to hear less of all these pot stories on the TV, radio, and websites. We get it. It's legal as of January 1st. I hope this all calms down quickly because it's getting exhausting. <laughs> And we heard from some of you about Jay Shesky's story of a handmade onesie called a sunsuit in the Philippines that's become one family's beloved tradition for 75 years and 60 babies. This is special in so many ways. This is really nice. Has anyone ever written down the instructions for making this sunsuit so others can make one? The answer to that question is no, but Mary Grace Pingoy and her family shared this photo for anyone interested in copying the design. You can find that photo on our website. And as always, we appreciate hearing from you. You can join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter or post your comments on our website. And that is our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Robert Clifford is the honoree of this year's Illinois Bar Foundation's annual fundraising event that raises money to enhance the availability of justice for those without attorneys throughout the state.